Everybody, welcome back to uh, this episode of Think Business Exclusives. Uh, Neil, I'm really looking forward to connecting with you about your about your book, Converted, uh, The Data-Driven Way to Win Customers' Hearts. Um, I want to give a little bio on you so people understand what we're, um, you know, who we're talking to. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a groundbreaking guidebook to unleashing the full potential of your customers. We're going to talk a lot about that today. Uh, you're an analyst, a researcher, an inventor, a lecturer, um, and in your words, the father of many forgettable slides of glossy funnels and Venn diagrams. As Google's chief measurement strategist, uh, you have led thousands of engagements with the world's biggest advertisers, helping these companies acquire millions of customers and generate billions of dollars. Let's let's talk about the customer today, right? Let's well, let's start yeah. talking about um, like, what does the customer look like, and 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 how, what are their habits today? It, as we sit here, you know, April 2022, you know, especially we're still in COVID, but we're, you know, in the endemic, hopefully, of COVID. What is what is the customer? <laughs> what does it look like today? You know, the customers, I would just say we've accomplished probably more in digital over the past, you know, two years and what was expected really pre-COVID for the 10 years that should have followed. And so just an acceleration of trends that we already saw. And I would say that really from about let's say about June, July of 2021, probably returning closer to normal than anyone would suspect. Yeah. We tend to highlight a lot of the differences. We still know we're working from home, a hybrid situation, and it turns out not all those necessarily flow through to how we behave. A lot of the new customers acquired from businesses during the pandemic, they were gone by that time. Yeah, A lot of the customers that were already there that were spending more money their habits are slowly returning to normal. Now, there are some industries that are a little bit further behind, and that ties generally to things like the return to office, like travel. You know, you, you see articles in the Wall Street Journal about capacity of flights returning to pre-pandemic normals, but the mix is a little bit different. So mm -hmm. businesses aren't traveling as much. And so you see a lot of people on those planes, but are they still the high-value business travelers that we saw in the past? Yeah. And that's not necessarily the case. So I, I would say that the changes are not as dramatic as people would have expected them to be. There's certainly some large changes, but it's just slowly being pieced together. Where we're saying, hey, when we look at who our best customers were pre-pandemic, they're still around and they're still yeah. our best customers today. Let's talk a little bit about I want to I want to dive into something you said that the pandemic the last two years accelerated things. There was an article um, pre-pandemic that pointed to the idea that by the year 2030, 85% of the jobs, it was an article by Dell, 85% of the jobs that uh, will exist in 2030 don't exist today. And then many are saying that that even accelerated that piece of it. You know, what does, what does that look like from your perspective? I would just say companies are beginning to trust machine learning and automation just a little bit more. I would say prior to all this, it became really a, a concern with some companies to say, could these, could these computer programs make effective decisions and a lot of distrust in terms of their models? The pandemic forced that work to come, into, come, to, come to the forefront. You yeah. know, a great scenario is just if we look at planning, it was easy for a lot of companies just to look at what they did the previous year and say, hey, we expect things to grow three or 4%. Yeah. We can manage that. Now, all of a sudden, what, what do you do when you're looking at Q4 planning for your business? We're like, well, we can't compare 2019 to 2020, entirely different markets in 2021. Things were recovering. But what do we do now for the retailers that are planning into 2022? Yeah. Well, it turns out those manual processes don't work. So, again, more trust in the automation and machine learning. But that's not a bad thing because people associate that to say, well, you're replacing these people. They're re being replaced with machines. No, it's just companies and people are finding different ways to add value to their organization besides traditional practices. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because it's about adding value in many cases with a customer client centric point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the you, you, 
you call an organization, they say, hey, you know, if you want, you can text us and you'll get faster response. Uh, there are these bots that are set up for many companies where they're giving you the answers you need, right? Where um, fundamentally like, hey, where do I go on my computer to do X? Or I'm having this small problem, right? It, it seems like they're using these bots to take the commonly asked questions, the commonly asked concerns, and really help service in a timely fashion the consumer. And so is, is am I right in thinking that that's, you know, one way they're not necessarily replacing, but it's, 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 it's just basic, basic stuff that doesn't really need yeah. a human being. So the human You're beings can force right. it cheaper. Yeah. You're entirely right. Now, what I would say, though, is I would say still there are some hard fought lessons that need to be learned. And I'll use the analog to, to say phone menus are a great example. How many times have you called up? And I do this with, and I'm going to, I'll call out FedEx here because they're just relentless with it. You call up FedEx and you have a simple question and they send you through the phone menu. And yeah. you're just like, no, no, no. I, I just want to talk to a person. I don't want to talk to a machine. Now, that I worry is also what we're seeing with some of these early stage chatbots, where it's like, no, I don't want to talk to a computer. Just please connect me with someone that I can communicate with. Now, oftentimes what we're seeing there is really a business problem where a lot of companies are saying, look how many calls the chatbot or the phone menu were able to intercept, the cost yeah. we spend per call, how much money was saved. And I worry those metrics haven't caught up to say, well, what about the level of frustration some customers had during that path of automation? that eventually will come back to bite them when they'll say, look, we talk to our customers and they all hate our chatbot. They all hate our phone menu. So companies are learning the right way to approach some of these technologies. And I think oftentimes they can be a little bit heavy handed in just saying, we want to save money. We yeah. want to improve efficiency. We want to automate these processes. The way that I challenge people to look at them is that, you know, oftentimes when people think about scale of these technologies, they think, how great is a chatbot? We can have a single piece of software interact with thousands of customers. And then we don't have to. Imagine how great that is. But I say, here's the ultimate bar of that. Can those functions, whatever they are, chatbots or not, can they deliver the same experience that customers are expecting that you could deliver over the phone? And if the answer isn't that, then the question is, should you be pursuing that efficiency at that time? If machine learning yeah. can replace your planning and your ad targeting efforts, great, assuming they can do the same job or better. I don't think a lot of these things that insert themselves between customers have developed to the point where you're like, you know, wow, I really didn't want to talk to a person. I'm so glad I had a chat bot. There are some cases yeah. and when they get it right, it's amazing. <laughs> like, well, I didn't think this could be done this easily. Yeah. But then there's other cases where you're like on that phone menu, you're like, can I just please yeah, it's the worst. talk to somebody? Yeah, it's the worst. Um, all right, good. Let's, let's dive into, um, you know, how, how companies can use data, you know, your, your, your book converted. Um, thanks so much for sending it to me, a uh, data driven way to win customers hearts. Let's talk about that because I think, sure. you know, there's, there's the art of data and the science of data. And so, you know, I, I think a lot of times people don't know how to really use the data to capture new clients, to capture prospects, to, to keep them, you know, connected to the brand, to the company. So in your, in your studies and your findings in your book, dive into kind of some of the things that the What's reader will get and that customers and that <laughs> clients really are, that, you know, are missing. Well, let's, let's start with the basics. Data is boring. Data is yeah. underutilized. Data is respected, but the value is not necessarily captured. And mm -hmm. that's coming from a data person. Yeah. Right. But as I joke with people, uh, I don't read data books. So directly to my left, my full bookshelf. I know I have the executive one behind me. When you look at my full bookshelf, you're not going to see copies of data books that I read for fun. There's going to be reference manuals and technical guides. But generally what happens is a lot of business people just either put themselves in the data camp where data is part of their day to day work. Or they say that data has a layer of complexity that I don't understand, that I don't appreciate. Yeah. And what I find odd is that we often pass that back and we say, well, if you don't understand the statistics in the machine learning models, you didn't dedicate yourself to the science. And I really wanted to write a book that pushes back in the other direction to say, I want to be able to write something that shows you how accessible data can be when you're purposeful and deliberate about telling the story. Yeah. And so a lot of it just ties back to this language we've already been talking about, which is you know, can we see people as people? You know, we, we forget sometimes that when we look at the way that we interpret things online, it didn't come through some rational, studied, perfected approach. It came from, here's a whole bunch of engineers with a bunch of log files that needed ways and things to call people. 
So like, well, what are we going to call us? We're going to call us a, a bounce rate and we're going to time on site. And this was, remember hits? We used to call them that. Now, that's not human language. And so we force people to learn the language of data and then figure out how do we translate that back to what we know. And where we're seeing companies going to say, look, that's a futile pursuit. It's a futile pursuit to have this, this huge block in between our data and what we're trying to do. What if we reposition everything just to say, let's get back to who matters. Let's get back to the customers. Who are these customer relationships? And similar to that phone menu problem, how do we treat customers online in a, the same scalable way as we might treat them if they were in store? So effectively, scaling is no longer about reaching millions of people. Scaling is about saying the same experience I could deliver if I were face to face with my customers. How do I challenge and deliver that online? How do I yeah. look at data through that lens and build that relationship? How are we? How are customers doing that? Well, in, in general, they're starting by really figuring out, well, who are my customers? Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like a bizarre thing to mention because everyone's like, well, anybody that buys, is that really the case? And again, I use relationships. I, when, when you mentioned to someone, if I were to be like, are they a friend of yours? Now, I know more nebulously, like when I was younger, are you dating that person? Like, are you, are you together or not? That's a little bit harder to ascertain, but we can use yeah. math to figure it out. Uh, it's the same thing with customers. So many companies have lists of email addresses and huge CRM systems where they generally assume, well, if somebody bought something for me, aren't they a customer for life? What yeah. about these people you haven't seen for a while? And so the very first starting point is defining, well, who are your customers? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of times, Neil, I find that people don't really know all the nuances of their customer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, Let's, for the sake of this question, let's assume they do. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about something you said when I talk, when you talked about marrying the data and the story, right? So you have this data and, and I, 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 what I find as a business coach is sometimes people don't think of things as a story. They're not as good of storytellers. They're not building a story. And, and to me, people connect to stories. So no matter what position you're in, you're always telling a story. And so how do you take the data? How do you guide clients to take data and then build a story around it? Well, it's, it's, it's very much an extension of the language we've been talking about. So let's keep it within the realm of human relationships. One of the very first things that I cover in the book is simply saying, what's the situation today? Now in business speak, what would we do? We'd show bullet points. In data speak, what would we do? We'd build data tables and say, well, here's, here's what all of our numbers look like. Let's talk about it in a human speak. What's happening? It's millions yeah. of companies proposing on a first date. Now, what does yeah. that mean? Well, it means that too many companies are focused on just generating what they want, that they're going in and saying to customers, buy our product now. If you don't buy right now, if you don't accept my proposal, this was a wasted engagement. And they were saying, but that's not how people work. People want that relationship. They take time. And what you're saying is, okay, now we know the metrics are wrong. And we say, all right, well, how do we develop this? Well, what metrics should we be looking at that can say, when well, we meet somebody, all right, well, they didn't, we didn't propose to them and, and we don't know if they're going to marry, but do they have potential? Are they going to be someone that's close to us in our business providing a lot of value? Or are they going to be more just pure transactional? We see them once or twice and they disappear. And we have the same people in our own life, right? We have our friends, our family members, our, our partners. We have, I joke around, the Uber drivers, you know, yeah. nice people really nice people and really helpful at that moment, but I'm never going to see them again. Yeah. And then once we have that understanding to use the data, not just to have the data thrown at us, but to say, all right, now that we understand where everybody fits in our lives, where everyone fits in our business, who do I get along with? Who are the people? What are the attributes? What are the behaviors of people that contribute a lot of value to me in my life? And what are the people that maybe take it away from me? The people that I could probably do without. And then the story continues to evolve. Well, now that we know who's providing the most value, what's the natural thing we want to do as human beings? We want to find more of those people. Yeah. Well, how do we do that? How do we acquire those people? How do we keep the relationships of the friends that we have around? And how do we know when to intervene when things may be going south? And these are stories. These are actions that we take every day that for some of those mom and pop stores that they do in person, but then you say, how does this translate to anything you're doing online? Yeah. And it doesn't, it's just, it feels soulless. It feels like, well, data and we target people and we show them pictures and I say, well, okay, let's, let's get there. Let's close that gap a little bit. Yeah. So take me to, let's, let's go into the, uh, a conversation in the boardroom. 
right? Mm-hmm. And so one of my favorite stories is that um, Sam Walton, who founded Walmart, uh, the story goes that, you know, everyone in the boardroom would be giving him all of the data, you know, and telling him, we need to do this based on the data, da 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 and, and he realized that most of the people in that room weren't even the, um, cl- the, the quintessential ideal, you know, or the current client of Walmart. So he would take that data, go to the diner, have coffee and pie um, with, the, with his clients, and then he would go back to the boardroom and filter out what was not important to them, right? So he really understood how to utilize data and the art and the science of using the data that actually means something to your customers to to service them at the highest level and to get more in the door and to retain and keep them coming back. And so how when they're at how when people are in the boardroom, mm-hmm. how do they how do they look at data and how do they know what to filter? You know, I'd, I'd say the first thing is the the understanding that if anybody's telling you that data has a complete story, they're lying to you or worse, they're ignorant of it. Uh, Mm -hmm. The more data you capture and the more that I've learned over time, especially working at Google with a tremendous amount of scale they have on data, the more you collect, the more you realize the gaps that exist. Yeah. Now the, the challenge of a leader is not necessarily to be able to discern that, to find an absolute truth. I believe equal, I, I believe equally that that is impossible. Uh, you know, I, I work with a friend of mine who's actually like a, a literal rocket scientist comments about how easy his job is relative to business people because he has rules. Gravity doesn't change. And if it does, it changes in very predictable ways. Human behavior, a little bit of a different question because we have right. trends, habits, we're emotional, irrational individuals. And so we look at it as we say, all right, so the first point of data is data is not necessarily to inform everything. It's to provide a different and credible perspective. But we also don't necessarily want to undercut that to say data is telling us the whole story. Mm -hmm. So the other question is, what do we believe to be true? What do we observe? What do other people in the organization? This is why storytelling is important, not simply to make it accessible, but to encourage other people who may not have a data background to share what they're seeing, what the data might miss. And now the question really at that point, and this is where it becomes more of a process, is to say, if the data is telling you one story and you have people on your team telling you another one or your intuition and experience saying a third, how do you sort that out to find a better way forward? Yeah. And this is where testing is so important to say, the result of what you're doing in the boardroom is not necessarily to find truth. It is to find a hypothesis. Yeah. It's to find something you can test and you can try in the field to say, I think if I say this, they, they might smile and then go yeah. and test it. Yeah. And so you can well, come back. Yeah. But again, and here's where I think a lot of companies, even companies that get it to that part where they screw up is they say, all right, I don't have, I don't have a truth. I have a good, I have an assumption. I have a hypothesis. I can test it. And then when I test it, I'll have that truth. No, you won't. What you'll have is you'll have a better sense as to where to go forward. Somebody be like, well, that blew up. I probably shouldn't do that. Or that was kind of successful. Maybe I'll keep doing that. But all you'll have is a better direction. And if you do that enough times, then you simply pull ahead of your competitors. You will have better relationships than the other companies they deal with that are trying to understand everything through the spreadsheets. And for business, that's enough. That's enough to be successful. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about you, right? You know, so you are, you're the chief measurement strategist at Google, but, um, but take me back, you know, 30, 40 years, right? You, (laughs) You know, you, 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 you're, um, who was the first mentor or the, that gave you a piece of wisdom that you thought, hmm, maybe in the moment or in hindsight, this oh, is, God. this is, this is going to help me, uh, you know, kind of track my, my path in life. You know, I'm I, I'm not sure I could tell you who the first one was because I'm thinking I'm sure there were th- things like that, like grade school me found incredibly provocative that now yeah. if I tried to sell the story, I'd be like, so we were dissecting a frog. Yeah. I- I'll tell you this. Um, there are moments in people that I've come across where I found that powerful. For instance, uh, when I started working with the Wharton professor, Pete Fader, who just focuses on this customer analytics, customer centric businesses, connecting a lot of what I saw in the field, what I was able to build from experience he provided the math. Again, that intersection between data and storytelling. A gentleman at Google, Avinash Kaushik, who's arguably one of the best storytellers that I've come across, 
showing people how great a well-developed data story can be. Yeah. Because when you see something that's like, wait a minute, there's no agenda slide in executive some you're just going right in and you're telling stories and how provocative they can be. Uh, I also joke around with people. I work with, uh, you know, one of the people I learn a lot from is actually, I, I have a, a coach I work with in Chicago on presentations and storytelling. Uh, he, by, by trade, is not a marketer or a business person. He's an actor. But it's phenomenal because he can look at the content we have and he can do two things. One is, if I were to give him the notes of what I present and I ask him to tell the story, he can do it 10 times a better job, even if I'm like, you don't know anything that you're saying. But you can just see how those skills and how inflection and tone factor mm -hmm. in. But also, it's good to often have people outside your field who can call you to be like, look, I don't care about any of this. Right. Like we go in front of audiences and we're presenting in front of a board. Maybe the expectation is, look, the people want to hear about what I'm talking about. Look, they carved out time to talk about marketing. <laughs> One of the best lessons I ever learned was, no, they don't care. They may be there. It may be on the agenda, but they could be thinking about their kids at home. They could be thinking about a vacation that comes at the end of the day, the flight they're going to catch. When you work with audiences that don't care about your data, that don't care about your story, it challenges you to develop better content for them right? and to yeah. actually make them care. Yeah. And so what types of things, you know, what types of things should people be measuring? If you had to kind of look at the, the list of like the top three things that companies need to be measuring, because I'm a big believer as a business coach, it's really important to look at very specific and measurable goals, look at things in a, you know, and measure and quantify what are some of the top, what are the top one, two or three things that every company needs to measure on a daily basis for optimal growth? Well, I'll tell you, the very first one that I look at, oddly enough, is not marketing specific. But here's a little bit as to how it goes. One of the exercises I love running with the company, something I talk about briefly in the book, is that I love companies to challenge me because I want to know the ideas that they're generating. Yeah. And so oftentimes soliciting from their employees to be like, what is it that you want to test? If there is no budgets, if there's no structure, no hierarchy, what are you, the things you think the business should do? That's question one. Question two, what data do you have to back it up? I need something. I can't just go purely on intuition. I'm a data guy. Three, how would I test it for what would we do differently if this turned out to be true? Now, yeah. companies that do this process, it's interesting to encourage people. They actually reward employees who generate the most audacious, the biggest ideas, yeah. even before they're tested. But here's what I measure. I look at how many ideas were generated and I look at how many ideas were actually tested. And those two metrics work as a great proxy for innovation. This is what I like seeing. So when I'm going through, I want to see, well, how, if you didn't develop new ideas, well, then you need more data. You need more people. You need more analysis. Yeah. But if you generated a whole host of ideas and you couldn't execute on them, then why are you still capturing more data? Let's talk internally about the approvals and the steps required. How do you break down those silos? And now I just boil them together and I say, what is that number? And how was that number able to improve? Because if that number is stagnant or if it's low relative to your peers, I know that they're learning more about their customers and testing new stuff. And that's going to give me a better perspective as to how that company is going to do than any other metric they have, including revenue. And one of the things you've done a lot in our talk is, you know, provide questions for people, right? Questions to ask themselves, questions to ask the board, questions to ask Customers and in your book um, on page on, on page twenty nine. Let me see what chapter is. Chapter three, you know, chapter three, which is called asking questions. You know, if you go to page twenty nine, it says the art of asking questions. Yes. And one of the things, you know, as a business coach, I talk about this a lot, and because asking questions, whether you're a manager, a salesperson, a leader in an organization, that's where the the magic happens, it right? Does. And so talk a little bit the, about the power of asking questions and being an active listener. I, I, would, I would say that there's no, there's no better talent, as you, as you said, for an executive to have that curiosity about what's happening in the world around them, right? Desk yeah. is a terrible place to which to view the world. But a lot of executives, what they'll say is, this is the data that we have. They'll ask those questions. Well, I, what, did, what did sales look like? What did customers feel like? Well, here's our customer survey. And I think it's just too yeah. far removed from the reality of it. And so a lot of that is about why when you go to websites, uh, does the e-commerce checkout process look the exact same as it has for the past 10 years? Where people are asking you questions, but they won't ask anything more than shipping or billing information. Or the only time that companies ask for your feedback 
is during their annual survey, which, you know, for the sake of comparison, is always the same. And so I think that that curiosity and that data collection has turned into such a large and organized beast that companies lose that spontaneous, hey, can't we just go out and ask customers what they think? Yeah. Because they're so, so worried about disrupting existing processes. And so really the lesson to leaders is to say, you probably come up with hundreds of questions every week, things that you're curious about with your consumers, but you write it off in your mind because you either don't have the data from your existing teams or you think it's going to be too hard to collect. Yeah. And so almost indulging that curiosity, say, if you have a question about how your customers are thinking or behaving, to find ways and channels to build that competency so you can ask yeah. and so you can learn. And then once people give you feedback, understanding truly where that feedback is coming from and what they mean. Because oftentimes, people can't exactly, when we do surveys, there's always a bias. Now, for instance, you may, uh, we, we did a survey one time at Google where we asked people, and this is a calibration question on a survey. We said, what color is the orange ball? And you were surprised as to how many people got that color question wrong. You had people selecting red, blue, everything. Yeah. That's going to be part of data. If you ask people how they heard about your brand, and you have one of those dummy questions be like, You'll see people answer, oh, I heard about it from TV, except you know you never actually advertised on TV. You also know right. how those questions come back. You're always going to have that. But there's always that follow-up question to say, can you learn more about why or why yeah. they report it in a particular way or what you can do with that data? Yeah, I love it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Google. What's it like working at Google? You know, I mean, Google, you know, I think I would imagine that's a very commonly asked question. You know, what's it What's it like working at Google? And and what does the you know the chief measurement officer do all day? You my my role I'll tell you is uh, I'll tell you two things I'll tell you one story about why I love Google and I'll tell you another story about what I do. Um, early on when I joined the company I came from a startup doing data and analytics as a director over there, and one of the first projects I had was a revenue analysis, and it was to say we had a new feature coming out, and uh, it was to say all right well if we roll this feature out what do customers do? And of course, what I did, you know, I had to present this as my first analysis to a big VP. So you piece all this stuff together. And here you go on the top. You know how you do this. You sort the spreadsheet. Here's all the money we can make by this product, all the, the big opportunities, right? That's what salespeople like to see. Uh, the, the gentleman that was, that was there, Alan, was going through, he's scrolling through. He's like, wait a minute. He's like, these numbers seem to get smaller. I was like, oh, yeah, I sorted the top of one. He's like, what happens is like, do we have some customers that get to zero? I'm like, yeah, there's some customers that don't make more. We don't, they don't spend more with us. He's like, are there customers that go negative? Now, effectively, are there customers that if they use this product, they spend less money with us? So we had an optimization product that said, you're overspending with Google. And I have this product in front of a gentleman whose a large portion of his money comes from hitting a sales quota. And I say, well, yeah. And I scroll to the bottom and there's about 15, 20% of the customers that are spending too much money. And so I asked him, I said, what, what, what do you want to do? And he's like, go tell them. What, what, what? He's like, yeah, go tell them. Go tell them they're spending too much money with us. And I was like, seriously? And he's like, yeah. He's like, that's the point of data. The point of having all this information is to provide people with an understanding as to where things are going and what they should do. If our products are not working for them, they shouldn't be giving us their money. And so we need to go back and inform our products. And, and that's always took me a lot and it carries forward even to this day. I mean, this was 11 years ago at Google, but still to this day, the idea of being open and honest with data is really the best thing you can give to any of your analysts. Yeah. All too often companies, data-driven decision-making becomes data-driven selling, right? You see the product manager, this is my product. I spent three years building it. It needs to go out. I will give you all the positive data. Or you're in those meetings where it's like, look, don't have a yellow or red number on the dashboard because you know you're going to get grilled. And yeah. it's one of those cultures where, you know, they care as much about why people are overperforming as they do underperforming. Because if you're, if you're far ahead of projections, the question was, what did you learn that you can apply to the business? And so what you see as a data culture, a lot of people look from the outside. It's just because they think Google has a lot of data. No, what they have is they have a culture that encourages people to use that data in the right ways, to be curious, to ask those questions, to learn from customers. And then at the end of the day, trusting them to do the right thing with that data. Yeah. And so that makes it a lot of fun. Now, what do I do with my time? My time is I spend a lot of time externally with our advertisers, very much like that same meeting, trying to help them use the data that they have. So it's not necessarily going in and saying, well, here's all the different ways you can use your data to spend more money on advertising. It's in fact the opposite. It's to say, here's all the ways you can use this data to find growth in your business. And if our products are properly developed, properly positioned, then our products will help. 
but yeah. they're they're not they're not the cause of this conversation. They're simply a byproduct of it. That if we have something that will accelerate it based on the data, use it. But first and foremost, we think you have a bigger opportunity of growing if you're able to use data more effectively, to use it in a more human way, and to tell some better stories because of it. Yeah, I love it. I love the whole idea of storytelling. How would you sum up your story in three sentences? Well, three, that's, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> what was that Mark Twain quote? Like, I, I couldn't write you a short I had more time, I, I'd write a shorter speech. But how would you, you know, the success <laughs> is not a straight line. How would you, how would you share your story? I, I would say that, I, I would say as many people would probably argue that it's, a, it's still a work in progress. Yeah. When people ask me, they say, well, where are you going to end up? What's the end of this story? I can tell them that with a little bit of certainty. I can say, if you're looking for me in a couple of decades, you'll find me teaching. I love teaching. I love teaching. And I love, I love showing people new stories and how they can interpret the world in different lens, particularly from a quantitative one. But yeah. people often ask, they say, well, if you love teaching so much, why don't you go teach now? What are you doing? And, and I, I'll, I'll simply tell you that I don't feel like I have enough stories yet yeah. to teach with. And yeah. so right now I'm in that process. We're still, uh, still learning, still curious, still building those stories. And then hopefully, as this book shows, this is kind of one insight into that storytelling but, you know, give me another 20, 30 years and you'll see me, you know, just yeah. sharing those stories, hopefully to the next generation of marketers to inspire them to go find their own. I love it. That's a great thing to end on. You know, just every the power of everybody building more, building their story, building more stories. Quick speed round for you, Neil. Um, besides your own favorite book and why? Uh, favorite book. Uh, I love the cartoon guide to statistics, to be honest. Okay. Okay. And I, I, by the way, I say it just because it's remarkable. I had this during my grad school. Dean stood up. He's like, here's a textbook, $200. Here's a cartoon guide, 20 bucks. You'll probably learn more. And to this day, not only do you learn more from those types of books, but you realize how awesome storytelling books can be around complicated subjects. Yeah. So it's kind of like it. a dual purpose book. Yeah. Finish this sentence. One thing um, everyone can do to find their story is... One thing they can do. You know what? I, I'll tell you this. My secret when I write stories is I write them for my kids. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my kids are two and four. They don't, two and five. They don't care about my stories. Later on, they yeah, will. Today. But at least as a parent, I get the sense that they're going to love me no matter what. So the worst thing that I can do to them is try to, try to pitch them, try to impress yeah. them. I think they benefit more just from honesty and learning something. And that's a nice way. Yeah. A lot of people are like, you got to create for your audience. No, no, I, I, I create, even when you see me on stage, I'm thinking about my kids because it's just the most honest, pragmatic stories I can tell. Yeah, I love it. Define yourself in one word. Curious. Love it. Human. Tell everybody, tell everybody, tell everybody where they can buy your book, connect with you and, uh, and learn more about Converted. The book, the book is on Amazon. You'll, you'll find it over there, Converted. Uh, that's going to be, the, just look for the yellow book. It's available on Kindle audiobook and a hardcover format. Uh, if you want to talk to me, questions, comments, feedback, you think I'm, I'm insane. Uh, LinkedIn tends to be the best. I can't, I, again, I, like, I can't describe myself in short sentences. I certainly can't tweet, but LinkedIn will let me write as much as I want. Yeah. Uh, so always feel free to reach out there if you have any questions. I love it. I love it. Neil, I appreciate you taking time. Uh, the book is great. Uh, I, I love everything that, um, that you share uh, today and in the book to talk about how to, uh, how to grow a business and how to connect with your customers more. Um, I appreciate you being on the show. Think community, uh, amazon.com. Check it out. You can go buy it today. Neil, thanks, man. I appreciate your hey, time. John, thanks for having me.